Hey, you guys know the X-Men theme song? Like, from the cartoon? The one that goes like... Yeah, that's a pretty good song. But have you heard the Japanese version? Oh, there's no bit after that. I just think it's a cool song. What are you looking forward to most about this film? Well, um, I think I'm looking forward to cracking up. Now, like I said in the last video, I was originally going to make a worst superhero movies video on X-Men Origins Wolverine. It was between this and Catwoman. And as you know, Catwoman won. And let me try the remix. <laughs> Now, I guess I understand that a lot of audiences were asking for an origin for Wolverine. And I don't really know why, because we get enough of his origin in the other movies. And X-Men Origins Wolverine doesn't really even answer any questions that you think they would answer. Like, the first thing I would ask, as you know, a normal person, is why does he call himself Logan? Because his real name is James, this movie teaches us that. But no, this film does not actually tell us why his name is Logan. Sometimes they call him Logan, sometimes they call him Jimmy. What the fuck? You think that might be like an important thing to explain to the audience? In fact, if you look at this movie as an introduction to the X-Men mythos, you're gonna be pretty fucking confused because it makes the other movies make less sense. This movie makes Logan and Sabretooth biological brothers, which wasn't a thing. And especially when you consider the fact that this movie ends with them being on good terms, then nothing makes sense at all. Because they were mortal enemies in X-Men 1. And it's not like Sabretooth had anything to say about finally meeting up with his long-lost brother once again. I don't even think he said anything in that movie, now that I think about it. I complained about these inconsistencies a lot in the last video, but let me tell you, this movie isn't about to fix any of that. And I'm sorry, but there's something truly hilarious about the screen freezing, showing us a war-torn wasteland, and then seeing a credit for Will I Am- See, this is the kind of shit that I like. This is the best kind of bad superhero movie because it thinks that it's the coolest movie ever, but it's actually the most absurd shit you've ever seen. I think if anything, you could definitely make the case that this is the funniest X-Men movie ever. <laughs> Like I said, this movie isn't really trying to give a detailed backstory to Wolverine. It ends up being less interesting than just giving him a metal skeleton and amnesia. Because sometimes the mystery is more fascinating. This film is basically the result of trying to write the most uninspired Wolverine story ever and brand it as an origin. In this, he's part of a Black Ops mutant team with his brother and a bunch of murderers until he's like, wait a second. I think murder's actually bad. And then we get another one of my favorite X-Men movie cliches, our hero finding a peaceful life in the mountains with a new pretty wife. Well, this is bound to go well. That's right, when you don't know how to motivate your X-Man into participating in a story, you just gotta kill their wife. It works every time. What's really noticeable though, is that I think this movie has some of the most cliche lines that I've ever heard. Like it was at the point where I could predict what the characters were going to say in almost every scene. Well, well, well. Look what the cat dragged in. I am nothing like you. Sure you are. You just don't know it yet. All their strengths and none of their weaknesses. <laughs> You miss me. Dude, who wrote this movie? I gotta know. That name looks really familiar. Oh, oh God. Wait a minute, I remember now. No, 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 no. Well, Danny kind of forgot about the Iron Fleet and you on Wait, 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 wait. Ghost Ride the Whip, Crazy Taxi. You see, this actually makes perfect sense when you think about it. If you guys remember in my Game of Thrones video, I criticized David's writing style by saying he writes the ending first and then basically twists the story unnaturally so he can get to that ending. And it's the same thing here, because since this is a prequel, 
Naturally, the ending of this movie is already decided. It just needs to end with Logan getting his metal skeleton and losing his memories. So everything in this movie is just here to get us to that point, and it's still somehow so unnecessarily convoluted. We already got context for the Weapon X experiment in X-Men 2, so we don't really need half of this movie to explain how he got his stupid fucking metal skeleton. And those movies also implied that the experiments are why he lost his memory. So that's it, that's all the explanation we should need. But no, we're gonna have to make an entirely new, more confusing backstory for Wolverine. So in this movie, Logan and his brother are immortal and they fight in a bunch of wars, but they have a falling out and Logan goes into exile and gets his hot wife. But then the evil Colonel Stryker is like, hmm, I kinda wanna put metal in his skeleton. I bet that would be kind of cool. But he has to get Logan to consent to the procedure, which is pretty dumb, but we'll get to that in a minute. So he tells Sabretooth to go kill Logan's wife so that Logan will try to kill Sabretooth in revenge. And then Logan will get his ass kicked and then go to Stryker and ask for the metal skeleton upgrade so that he can use it to kill Sabretooth in the rematch. That's the fucking story of this movie. See, in the comics, Wolverine just gets kidnapped and has the adamantium grafted onto him against his wishes. And I think that works just fine. Why does he need to consent to the operation if your plan is to just wipe his memories against his will afterwards? He didn't have to consent to that. You could have just kidnapped him at that rate. And the thing is, despite all this shit, Hugh Jackman really is trying his best to make this movie work but he cannot save this dialogue. Why didn't you tell me it was Victor? Also, somehow the effects in this movie are worse than the previous X-Men movies. Now, for some reason, Logan has these fucking Roger Rabbit cartoon claws. <laughs> Why are they like 2D? <laughs> but anyway, this movie is basically divided into two halves. The beginning is mostly just plagued with the cliche script, but otherwise it's your average boring superhero origin story. But the second half, that's where this truly becomes a ridiculous over-the-top action movie with no rules or logic. And I mean it, this is probably the dumbest action movie that I've watched on this channel in a good while. Like why are they trying to sandwich a motorcycle with a truck and a helicopter. This movie also strangely decides to throw in Cyclops halfway through. Yeah, try to figure out how that makes sense. I just really don't understand what the issue is with the continuity of these movies. It's driving me crazy at this point. Like in X-Men 2, Stryker very clearly wants to get rid of all the mutants. He wants to kill all of them, period. But in this movie, his ultimate plan is to take all of the mutants and combine their powers into a super mutant. This is like the exact opposite motivation. If you watch these two movies back to back, it's impossible to think of these as the same character. Oh, and like I briefly mentioned before, this movie features Will I Am as one of Logan's buddies. And I really gotta say, this man has no right trying to act. We hunted our own kind, Logan. There's a special place in hell for the things we did. <laughs> There's a certain point where this movie just becomes a comedy. It plays it so seriously for the first half of the film, and now it's just goofy. That's like the best word I can use to describe this. It's just a goofy movie. That's cool. Like, look at this. This is a fucking cartoon. This is the dumbest thing I've ever seen in a superhero movie, and I am not lying when I say that. So anyway, our ultimate culmination of the plot is that Wolverine's wife is secretly alive. And I'll be honest, I actually didn't see this coming. This is a genuine twist, but only because it's the stupidest thing that this movie can try to pull. So if we just squeeze this into our plot that already doesn't make any sense, we get this. Stryker needs to get Logan to agree to be in the Weapon X program. So he lets him leave his mutant strike force. Then he hires a sexy psychic lady to go undercover as Logan's new wife so that in a few years, Stryker can get Sabretooth to pretend to kill her so that Logan will then try to kill Sabretooth, lose the fight, and then go to Stryker to get the metal skeleton. And I'd like to bring to everybody's attention that all of this falls apart when you realize that every other mutant in Stryker's program was kidnapped by him. We watch him do it. 
So why not just kidnap Logan? Why did this movie need to happen? And to top it all off, this movie, of course, has Ryan Reynolds as Deadpool for the first time. And it's so poorly done and so stupid that the new Deadpool movies are still making fun of it at every opportunity. And this character's inclusion is kind of a good example of what this movie stands for. It just takes something and it ruins it for no reason. And honestly, the worst thing about this story is that all character development is undone by the fact that this movie needs to end with our hero getting amnesia. Logan actually does have a character arc in this movie, if you'll believe it, but none of it matters because we just have to wipe the slate clean. Oh, and how does this movie plan to wipe his memories? Well, believe it or not, they wipe his memories by shooting him in the head with an adamantium bullet. Okay, hold on, hold on. I'm pretty sure... All right, it's not in that one. I'm pretty sure, okay? I'm pretty sure that's not canon. And I could really be an asshole and point out the fact that in this movie, they say that the bullet wouldn't kill Wolverine because it, that would be stupid. That doesn't make any sense. But then in Logan, like, you know, the movie Logan, they used the bullet to kill the other Wolverine, but I don't care. I'm not gonna worry about it. I'm gonna get a headache. Anyway, the bad guys are defeated. The movie is over and what? You can walk, but, but in the, in the next movie, you, why did they do that to your face again? Fuck it, I don't care. Throw it on the tier list. Three out of 10, we're moving on. This movie is fucking pretty good. Yeah, I actually kind of like this movie. I think I only know one person who's seen this one. And I think that this is probably the one X-Men movie that I know the least about. And I feel like I've said that about a lot of these movies, but this time I'm for real. I said this before, but I really like when the opening of a movie hooks you in. We're already seeing a more interesting backstory event for Wolverine. I think him surviving an atomic bomb is pretty fucking crazy, and I'm glad that we have a movie that finally covers it. And after that, we get a scene where, God damn it, not you again. So yeah, this movie's set after X-Men 3. So Logan has PTSD nightmares about Jean Grey. I mean, I kind of do too, after watching that shit. But despite this, I think this movie has a much better story than most of the shit we've been watching. By this point, it's actually been a while since I've watched an X-Men movie that I've enjoyed. So I think this was just a pleasant surprise. The good thing about not knowing jack shit about this movie is that I was fully engaged in the story. I didn't know much about the Days of Future Past film when I went into it, but I at least had the comic in the back of my head so I knew a little of what to expect. But here I get to enjoy a fresh new story. And I think the story is the best part of this one. The premise here is that Logan goes to Japan to visit a guy that he saved during the Nagasaki bombings. And while there, he mysteriously gets his healing factor stolen. And this simple plot element does a lot to increase the stakes of this story. It can be difficult to give Logan something interesting to go up against because most movies just make him fight people who have swords or claws and he's like invincible, so he's never at risk of losing. But by taking his healing factor away, we now have some more realistic stakes. And this is such a unique and different story than what we've gotten before. I was worried that we would see the same overdone shit that we've seen in every Logan-centric movie, but the new setting and this new Wolverine-specific threat have made things very enjoyable. And I also gotta say, I really like the action in this movie. There are some creative action set pieces here, and in this movie, Logan's on the run from the Yakuza, so there's a lot of ways to organically include the action scenes. There have been a lot of Wolverine fights in the other movies that were just thrown in to ward away our boredom, but that doesn't really feel like the case in the first half of this movie, and the fights really do have good choreography, and the cinematography doesn't slack here either. However, to complain a bit, I don't really like the fish-out-of-water narrative very much. Logan in this universe is very unfamiliar with Japan, and Japanese culture, which is very surprising because in the comics, he's basically a fucking samurai. And this is just another reason that this version of Wolverine annoys me. Hugh Jackman's Wolverine always feels like he's in over his head. He never seems to have anything under control and he always has to have shit explained to him. And that's not really how comic Wolverine is. In the comic books, he's hot-headed, but he doesn't really get overwhelmed as much as this version of the character does. This guy really just never seems to know what's going on. He's always confused about something. And it's been like this since the first X-Men movie. Like, dude, you are so old. 
You should know how the world works by now. This leaves me feeling a little conflicted because while I do respect Hugh Jackman's performance of this character, I don't like this version of the character that much. And I also do have to address the elephant in the room. See, this movie is pretty good, up until it isn't. A lot of people say this movie jumps the shark, and I think that's putting it lightly. I went from really liking this movie to rolling my eyes and being incredibly disappointed. And it happens very suddenly, because I was enjoying myself pretty close to the end of the movie, and I think Logan performing surgery on himself while a samurai battle rages on is very exciting, and I thought the movie was about to wrap up soon. But then out of nowhere, we have to include one of the biggest ERJBs that I've seen in a very long time. Initially, this movie's about warring Japanese factions, and it's pretty interesting and fun to see the mystery of this movie unravel. But when we get to the secret underground lab and the adamantium samurai mech suit, I'll admit I was struggling to keep my laughter under control. Mm, yes, the tiny net is a death sentence. It's a net and it's tiny. This movie's pretty subdued up until the literal last 20 minutes. Logan goes from fighting Yakuza in the city streets to fighting fucking Megatron and a goofy ass snake woman. The action scenes also get a little sloppy here because it's just Wolverine fighting a CGI Gundam. We went from an interesting story with good fight scenes to this. This is really weird. It's like the movie just decides to stop being good. You said it, pal. So yeah, I'm a little disappointed. We were this close to greatness. So I guess I'm gonna give this one a six out of 10. It's almost a seven, but you blew it. Next movie. Oh, Logan is the best X-Men movie, nine out of 10. Hey, yeah, I wanna shoot, baby. Okay, fine. Most of you guys really, really, really want me to talk about this movie for some reason. I guess it's because I didn't review it back when it came out. And yeah, this movie is really good. It's almost a little too good. Like, how dare you be a good movie? You're supposed to be either okay or bad. Don't you know the rules? Now, I've said it before, but I've not really loved this interpretation of Wolverine that we get in these movies. If anything, binging these movies back to back has kind of made me like him less. After watching these while reading the comics, I honestly can't say they're the same person at all. Even though I haven't had the most extensive knowledge of X-Men comics before, I have enjoyed Wolverine in a lot of other stories. But with this movie, I think I can finally accept that these two versions of the character don't need to be the same. Because at the end of the day, Jackman does make the character his own, and I guess I can respect that. If anything, this little X-Men binge of mine has gotten comic Wolverine very close to edging out Daredevil as my third favorite superhero. And even if movie Wolverine isn't the same, I still have enough love for the character at this point and respect for Jackman's determination to really feel the emotion that this movie is going for. Now, yes, I think the story of bitter old violent man takes care of child is becoming kind of played out, but I do strongly prefer this to the usual narrative of Logan falling in love and not being able to be happy with his girlfriend. Like, that's really been his fucking story in every movie, and I'm kind of over it. I prefer this narrative approach because, to me, Logan works much better when he's a mentor or a father figure. Because I see him as a wise old man. But I think a lot of the movies have made him feel a little bit too much like a super durable 40-year-old. But this movie brings him back in the right direction. He finally feels like a guy who's been around for hundreds of years and has seen and done everything. And honestly, this movie's so good, you can kind of just ignore every other X-Men movie. None of them come even close to it. This is like a real ass movie. For one, the cinematography is the best out of any X-Men movie, and honestly, it's better than most superhero movies, period. Mangold is very obviously trying to make this a Western. He's not really hiding it either. And you can already draw a lot of comparisons between samurai and cowboys, especially in film, so this is a perfect next step for the character in this franchise. Overall, you can tell that James Mangold wants this film to stand out from your regular superhero schlock. And when people say this is the greatest superhero movie of all time, I really think that kind of discredits his efforts. It's just a good movie. And this is more of a comic book movie than a superhero movie, if you want to, you know, get technical about it. 
And it's no secret that I really like when movies are straight up miserable, and this does scratch that itch. But what I love is that it perfectly balances a miserable tone with light-hearted, charming moments. And there's also pretty good action. When I first watched this, I wasn't sure how I felt about its portrayal of Professor X, but after watching every movie that he's been in, and ending with this one, I think this serves just as well as his final film as it does for Logan. And this really is a knockout performance from Patrick Stewart. I always felt like while he was great as Professor X, in the other movies he never really got to show much emotion. But here, he really gets to act his pussy off. As good as Hugh Jackman is in this movie, I have to say that Patrick Stewart and Daphne Keene really are the stars of this show for me. And I really would like to see Keene in more movies. She has such a good presentation of X-23, and it's not easy to pull off being equal parts adorable and creepy. Really, the core of this movie is based on the fact that people really like movies about sad old men and children. People also really like superpowers. This movie is just fated to be good. It's just science. And yet, it goes above and beyond to be the best movie in the X-Men series. I think this movie just feels the most human. It feels the most real. If this movie didn't have any action scenes, it would still be the best one on the list. That's how good the emotion is in this film. Hell, my favorite scenes are the ones where the characters are just arguing with each other. And it's weird too, because when I first saw this movie, I definitely didn't like it as much as I do this time. I think I was nitpicking it a little bit too much, and I wasn't really the biggest fan of the X-Men movies. If I really had to force myself to find some things to criticize, I think the final boss being a young Hugh Jackman clone is edging on ERJB territory. And I do think that this movie is just a little bit too edgy. Now, I am fully in support of the violence and the gore of this movie. I think that that stuff is essential when Logan is the main character. But I do think some of the swearing sometimes comes across as a little unnatural. I don't really need to hear Professor X tell Logan to fuck off. Everybody else is allowed to swear, but he's not. He's not allowed to have a potty mouth. And you know, now that I think about it, most of the X-Men movies do use their one F-bomb, even the ones that are rated PG-13. And 90% of the time, they sound incredibly unnatural. Go fuck yourself. Fuck off. Who the fuck are you? If you touch her, I will fucking kill you. <laughs> I will fucking kill you, bro. <laughs> but either way, yes, this is the best movie in the X-Men series. I still think that First Class is my favorite movie that features the X-Men team, but this is the best movie in the franchise, I really can't argue it. It has the best story, the best character work, the best performances, it looks the best, it has the best action. It's not only the best X-Men movie, it's one of the best comic book movies ever made. And I would be a fool to give this movie anything lower than a 9 out of 10. Now wait a minute, have I ever told you guys what I think they're gonna do with the X-Men in the MCU? Everybody always says, oh, who's going to be the new Wolverine actor? I don't think there's going to be a new Wolverine actor. As we know, the MCU has been really into this multiverse nonsense lately. And, like, they're really leaning heavy into it. And by the time we get to Doctor Strange, I think it's going to be a lot more prevalent. If you ask me, I think they're just going to pluck the little X-Men out of this here Fox universe and just drop them into the MCU. It's probably the easiest and least confusing way to do it. And the main reason I believe this is because of Deadpool. They're not gonna recast Ryan Reynolds as Deadpool. He's just gonna be the same guy. I don't even know if this is a good idea, and other people have probably had this theory. I don't watch comic book movie YouTubers. That stuff rots your brain. But anyway, speaking of Deadpool. Hey, yeah, I wanna shoot. Baby. Now I hope this doesn't disappoint anybody, but this part of the video is going to cover Deadpool 1 and 2 at the same time. Because I really think these two movies are pretty much the same in quality. And I have to say, I've actually been looking forward to ending this video by watching Deadpool. Which is strange, because I normally am not the biggest fan of the character or of these movies. In the comics, Deadpool's shtick never really did it for me. I think a lot of his stories can be very cringe, early 2010 Reddit humor type stuff. Though I have enjoyed the character when he isn't the main focus. I love him in the Uncanny X-Force series where he has other characters to bounce off of. I think placing him in a darker, more serious story as a side character can be very effective. 
but having a whole story about him, yeah, let's say I wasn't excited to watch this when it first came out. But honestly, maybe I'm in a good mood because I didn't really mind watching these this time. For starters, I don't think I'm gonna shock anybody when I say that I love Ryan Reynolds as this character. I don't really like him in any other films, but he honestly is the only person I can see as Deadpool. To the point where I hear Ryan Reynolds in my head when I read Deadpool dialogue in a comic. Okay, you know, that's actually probably why I don't like reading Deadpool comics. But anyway, at the end of the day, I gotta respect him for being so committed to the character that he basically forced Hollywood to make this movie. Even if it's not my favorite character, I can appreciate that Deadpool is his favorite because that passion does come out in his performance. And I will say that this movie was a pleasant surprise when I first saw it. I was not expecting the jokes to be as meta as they are. I knew we'd get jokes about X-Men movies from the past, but I didn't expect jokes about Green Lantern and the real life actors who are playing these characters. But the problem with meta jokes is that they only work once. They only work when you don't expect them. The best joke in the second movie is where Deadpool laments on how the movie can't afford any of the main X-Men, and then this happens. And it's really funny the first time you see it. It's kind of like the family guy problem. When most of your jokes are just reminding the audience about things that exist in real life, it wears a little thin and doesn't help repeat viewings. Other than the references, this movie is also just trying to be as edgy as possible, which works sometimes, but a lot of the time it feels like it's really trying too hard. And to bring it back to Family Guy, I think a lot of the best jokes in Family Guy are the ones that are PG. What's your name? Uh, my, my name? Uh, P, uh, uh, T, uh, uh, Griffin. And I think the same thing applies here. I laughed way more when the characters were just being witty or clever. Uh, no, no, Pinder. I could be of great use. What's your superpower? Cottage. That's adorable. The worst jokes in these movies is when they're trying too hard to be vulgar. You look like an avocado. Had sex with an older, more disgusting avocado. Yeah. Not gently, like it was hate fucking. <laughs> so funny. The funnier jokes in these movies are just the quick and simple ones. Wait. I'd go with you, but I don't wanna. It's pretty safe to say that the content of these films is kind of a mixed bag. I think movie one has bad pacing, but I don't know, I really don't mind that in an action comedy. Movie two has more insufferable jokes, but a more interesting story. I think in the first movie, the structure of the story does do a good job of showing just how nuts Deadpool is. I mean, he's our narrator and the story's being told out of order, so it's kind of appropriate here. But at the same time, I can't help but think that the movie might actually be better if it was just in order. But overall, I'm fine with the way this movie shakes out, even if it is a little simplistic and formulaic. In my opinion, I think simplicity is acceptable in a movie like this. And one thing I do have to give this first one credit for is that you do really feel for Wade in this movie. The story can be surprisingly emotional when it wants to be, but I do think the best thing about this movie is when you watch it for the first time and you're surprised with how much they get away with. And as far as the second movie goes, I think the story has a lot more going on and it does get a lot more ambitious with the storytelling. But the jokes have way higher highs and much, much, much lower lows. I don't know, maybe I'm broken, but I remember only laughing a couple times when I first saw this movie. When I watched this, I kinda just wanted this movie to show me more stuff that I've never seen before. Because that's what the first one did. It surprised me. And then this one is just kind of more of the same. I expected this one to up the ante and just go fucking nuts. For a second, I thought that's what we were gonna get with this opening scene of this guy running in slow motion but Deadpool isn't in slow motion. That's silly. That's something I've never seen before. And I really like the post credit scene because that's what I expected this entire movie to be. Just off the wall insanity. But no, like I said, this movie is still basically Deadpool part two. You can see that they've got a slightly larger budget, but that's kind of it. They feel very similar. And I don't know, again, maybe I'm broken, but I really can't handle humor like this. It's like, um, here we go. It's like he was giving birth anally, but they quit halfway through. They got the legs out and they said, you know what? I'm done. Happy? It's like he's a Muppet from the waist down, but this time you can see the Muppet's dick. Oh my God, I forgot they do this in both movies. Though I will say that Deadpool 2 is much more of an X-Men movie. And since I'm in an X-Men mood, it does carry this one for me a bit. 
Watching this after binging every single fucking X-Men film is kind of nice. It's like a little dessert at the end of this big meal. And like I said, I actually do like the story in this movie much more than the first one. Time travel just works for superhero stories. It's the only genre of movie that can make it work, and I do like that we have Cable in this one, because like I said, Deadpool works best when he has a straight man to bounce off of. And while I have been ripping into the humor quite a bit, there are still good jokes. I did laugh a bit while watching these movies. I guess it helps that I haven't seen these movies in a while, but some of these jokes really got me this time. You killed Black Tom, you racist son of a bitch! And finally, I do think the funniest parts in the second one are probably the cameos. There's a lot of guest actors in this one. Like, I didn't know that this is apparently Matt Damon. That's kind of funny. And this is kind of weird, but the action scenes are actually really fucking sick in these movies. Like, I didn't expect that, but I'll take it. I unironically think that the action is the best part of both of these movies. At the end of the day, these are action comedies, so I really don't feel the need to try to poke holes in the narrative or break down everybody's performances. All that stuff is perfectly acceptable in these movies. The movies are fun, I'm probably never gonna watch them ever again, and Deadpool 3 better be R-rated. You hear me, Disney? I mean it, don't fuck that up. So I'm gonna give Deadpool 1 and 2 a 5.5 out of 10. And that's it, every X-Men movie. So now let's rank them all real quick and... What, what the fuck is that? As one final turd in my cereal, Fox just had to squeeze out another bad X-Men story to end the franchise. See, this movie is very interesting. It was supposed to come out in 2018, but then it got delayed because they didn't want to overshadow Deadpool 2. Then it was supposed to come out in 2019, but they didn't want to overshadow Dark Phoenix. Yeah, go figure. And then finally, they wanted to release it in early 2020, but oopsie. Yeah, this movie was fucking doomed. And when you watch this movie, it's very hard to understand why they even bothered. This is by far the most unnecessary entry in the series. And the thing is, this one's bad for completely different reasons. To start, you'd think the acting in this movie would be better, but it's not. <coughs> it feels like I'm watching an episode of Riverdale. And it's weird because this movie stars the millennial late 2010s superstars. It's like they decided to get the most marketable young adults in Hollywood. But for some reason, we have everybody doing a weird accent that isn't their normal accent. Stranger Things Boy isn't really doing the worst job as Cannonball, but some of his lines are so fucked up by this goofy country boy accent. Uh, do, I, do I really have to spend my whole life in here for one mistake? Once you're better. I am being my better. We also have Anya Taylor-Joy doing whatever the fuck this is. I'll see you in hell. And the plot isn't enough to save this movie either. It's the least interesting story out of everything we've watched in these videos. This story features young mutants who are trapped in a facility, and the main character is a girl who's making everybody hallucinate all this weird shit. So we basically just have a handful of people in one building, all getting really upset for an hour and a half. The worst thing about this movie, though, is the tone. You see, this was marketed as an X-Men horror movie, and it is trying to do that some of the time. There are scenes where it's clear that we're going for a spooky teen thriller vibe, but then we also have scenes where Anya Taylor-Joy summons a Winter Soldier cyborg arm and a badass He-Man sword. Like, we were just talking about sexual abuse in this movie. Where did this shit come from? And like a lot of the bad superhero movies that we get nowadays, this one suffers from weird rewrites and reshoots, and you can definitely notice. What's gotten into you, Sam? Look, something's not right. I'm seeing things, terrible nightmares. Oh yeah, no, that was a very convincing edit. I could definitely tell nothing was changed there. It's a weird thing when a studio butchers a superhero movie. I've talked about it in previous videos and I plan to talk about it even more in future videos. But here I honestly think this movie was probably screwed from the start. It just isn't interesting enough subject matter for a story like this. Because we already know the whole mystery from the beginning. It is not hard to assume that the main character girl is causing the hallucinations and that the facility is run by evil people. But it still takes the entire movie to have these bits of information revealed to us. And this all ends up feeling like a bad young adult novel. 
And for once, I think this is the one movie that actually needs to be a little longer. Because this one's only an hour and a half, and with a story like this, it really does work better as a slow build of tension. If you want to have only a handful of characters and a single ominous setting, then that's fine but you gotta earn that over time. It probably would have been a lot better to just watch the characters slowly going crazy, but no, that's not what happens here. This movie is very rushed. The third act begins so suddenly with a forced attempt to tie this movie into Logan, which makes no sense because these movies are set in different timelines. And out of nowhere, the main antagonist just suddenly becomes insanely evil the second that the plot needs her to be. Like, she was a pretty chill lady, and then she just fucking loses it. By the time we get to the final confrontation, it's very hard to take it seriously, because now it feels like a completely different movie. When I started watching this, I swear to God, I did not think this was building up to a final battle with a giant CGI demon bear. There just isn't enough time to develop each character and flesh out their relationships with each other. Like, by the end, Cannonball doesn't even end up doing that much. I don't even remember him really using his powers that much either. He didn't have to be here. Usually ensemble superhero movies feature characters that all have something to do, and the movie's kind of written around them. But it feels like most of these characters were just chosen at random. Dog Girl could have been any other mutant, and it doesn't change the story at all. She barely turns into a dog. There's a guy in this movie that I forgot existed until I came back to edit the video. He seriously doesn't even need to be here. What are you doing? This person doesn't know what the hell he's doing! This movie is just so weird. And remembering that this is the final X-Men movie makes it even weirder. And I wish I could say more about it. I wish I could make fun of the movie more for you guys. But there's just nothing here to make fun of. This is probably the weakest ending to the Fox X-Men franchise that I could imagine. And while it's not good, I guess I can kind of see what they were going for. Deep down, I can kind of see someone's vision. I just don't think it's executed well at all. So yeah, let's throw it on the tier list. And uh, I'm gonna give it a four. I don't know, I don't really care anymore. So that's it, all the X-Men movies. Now let's rank them all for real this time and see how they stack up. Number 13, X-Men Dark Phoenix. It was pretty hard to decide which one of these was the worst. I think the final four movies in this list are really bad. So in the end, it really comes down to the fact that I never, ever want to watch this movie again. Number 12, number 11, and number 10. These three are on the same level of quality for me. They're really bad, but they did make me laugh quite a bit. Number 9, New Mutants. I think this is where we get to the end of the bad movies. Everything else from here on is kind of okay. I, I just don't remember anything about this movie, and I just watched it. Number 8, number 7, Deadpool 1 and 2. Like I said, these two are basically the same to me. I enjoyed watching them in the moment. I probably don't need to watch them ever again, and if I do, it's gonna be a while from now. But I like this version of the character, and I'd like to see him in more stuff. Number six, X-Men 1. Honestly, I kinda miss this movie now. I really took it for granted. I've seen so much stupid shit at this point that I kinda miss how subdued and normal this movie was. Number five, The Wolverine. This is where we're getting into movies that I did enjoy unironically. It's really a shame that this movie goes off the rails as hard as it does, but I gotta say, I really enjoyed those first two thirds. If things had ended just a little bit differently, I think this movie could be much higher. Number four, X-Men 2. This is where we get to the movies that I think are widely agreed to be pretty good, and X-Men 2 is probably the first good X-Men movie. This is a lot of people's favorite, and I can see why, even if it's not mine. Number three, Days of Future Past. This was probably my biggest surprise of the list. I didn't think I'd like this movie as much as I do, but hey, it's pretty cool. If I turn off my brain and pretend that this is the actual finale of the X-Men series, then I can live in peace. Unfortunately though, that's not the case. Number two, X-Men First Class. I really do love this movie. I think this one is the definitive X-Men movie to the point where I think just about anybody can watch this and enjoy it. It just has energy that the other movies don't have. I really like it, and I could probably see myself watching it again one day. And number one, to no one's surprise, is Logan. Yes, I know, very shocking, but Logan is the best X-Men movie. I almost don't want to count it because it's so much better than almost everything else on the list, but I have to be fair, it really does belong at the top. 
When you compare this to everything else on this list, it's kind of a joke. But hey, this one couldn't exist without some of the previous movies, so I guess I have to accept that. Overall, I think the X-Men movies kind of fail as a franchise, and it's very confusing as to how they kept going for so long. I praised X-Men 1 for trying to do its own thing, but over time you can see this franchise trying so hard to capture what the MCU was doing at the time. And it just doesn't work as well. So yeah, this was fun, but I don't think I'm gonna miss this franchise very much. Maybe in a few years we'll get a really, really good X-Men movie again, but who knows. I'll probably be there to judge that one too. Though I will say that while I don't really like the X-Men movies, I have actually fallen in love with the comics. I'm for real. Normally when I finish one of these big ass videos, I don't want to have anything to do with the series I'm reviewing once I'm done. But I'm actually still reading X-Men comics. I read a good chunk of the Claremont run, that's kind of like the definitive starting place for X-Men as far as I've seen. It's kind of crazy how many of the core X-Men concepts started in just one single run by one guy. So if you want to get into X-Men yourself, I definitely recommend starting there. And since I already know the characters pretty well, I've been jumping around a little bit, and I do think that New X-Men by Grant Morrison is my favorite so far. But I think it definitely benefits you to start with the Chris Claremont run before reading that, because some of the context does help. But yeah, even though the movies mostly aren't very good, I like the comics, so I guess there's a happy ending to all of this. But as usual, I'd like to see what you guys would rank each X-Men movie, I don't really know a lot of people who've seen all of them, so if you have, definitely let me know if you survived. And uh, tell me what I should review for next December. I don't actually have any ideas anymore. But please give me a good franchise. I don't think I can take something like this again. Okay, bye. Hey, it's Stan Lee. Zip it, Stan Lee!